So welcome everybody. My name's Derek Bell. I was a former, I'm a founder member even of Learners. I'm currently on the, the council and the director for a while. I'm, this afternoon we've got Kendra with us from Bath Spa University and we're going to be talking about retrieval and perhaps the richer forms of consolidating knowledge and strengthening the learning. Thanks, Derek. Um, thanks for being here tonight, everybody. Much appreciated. I uh, know how precious everyone's time is. Um, as Derek says, I work for Bath Spa University. Um, I used to be a primary teacher, and now my main role is that I'm doing a mixture of research and lecturing in the School of Education. But particularly for the last six years, we've been thinking about how the learning sciences, particularly neuroscience and psychology, might contribute to education and as Derek says there's one chunk of that this idea of retrieval that we're going to focus on today um, yeah I'm going to kick off in a minute by exploring what we mean by retrieval practice and what's already known about it um, and then Derek's going to talk a bit about what do we actually want to achieve by using retrieval practice and really get into some of what's going on in the brain um, and then I'll come back and think a bit about what this means for our pedagogy, for our teaching and learning. So what do we actually mean by retrieval practice? Well, I thought it'd be interesting to look at some of the definitions that have been used in different parts of the literature. So the first one here, bring information to mind from memory. That's perhaps the, the most basic simple way we can think about this it really is just that simple it's just bringing something to mind from memory a kind of deliberate form of, of um, remembering perhaps and the second one perhaps take us a little bit further because it's talking about this active recall of something that's been learned and that we might recall it with actually very little support there's a sense here that this process is effortful it might be quite hard work and the other way in which we're often seeing retrieval practice talked about is by this term the testing effect and that's because it really came out of this finding from cognitive psychology research that if you want to find out what strategies are good for helping learners retain information in their long-term memory. So that's one particular definition of learning being used there. If that's what you want to do, then actually testing the learners is better than getting it um, to re-study it. So that's the other kind of name for it. And that this idea that tests, low stakes tests in particular are useful for retrieval has really come to the fore. I think, all of these definitions have used that word information. And there's something about that word that makes you sort of think of little chunks of knowledge, sort of mini facts. And that's something that, even if that isn't what is the intention of the researchers, something we might think about because that idea is perhaps going into our, our way of thinking about what learning is more than we might want to. Here's another view of what retrieval is. And this one comes from FRAP First, and I would highly recommend her web pages to you because uh, they're fascinating. So she talks about the value of retrieval, not so much in terms of chunks of information and being held in long term memory. But she says, actually, what's going on is we're building new pathways of associations. We're closing gaps in knowledge and we're adjusting our existing knowledge to the current context. Because what we're doing is we're not just practice knowing it, we're practicing getting to the knowledge. So that's what she's saying is going on when we go through this process of bringing information to mind. So to try and explain a bit more, I say her pages give you this in, um, in more detail if you want to go and have a look. But suppose we imagine this kind of little blob here, this blob of four joined things is an existing concept. I'm going to suggest it could be a flower. So maybe we've formed that concept by connecting together different modalities, the shape of it, the colour, the word flower. We might even add in the word stamen or petal. And we could consolidate that by kind of revisiting that, that knowledge and this kind of thickening of lines. Yeah, we, we can revisit it and consolidate it. But maybe over here we've got a different 
concept could be fruit perhaps perhaps with seeds and maybe this concept over here could be an idea about bees and flies visiting flowers in a garden perhaps well first is suggesting that the process of retrieving the memory takes us through that kind of pathway as we're thinking wondering making all those additional thoughts on our way to that and we're actually reinforcing and strengthening a lot of other connections too and so in the process we're actually making that chunk of knowledge much more meaningful because it's becoming connected and so what we're doing there is we're reconstructing through that process of retrieval this is a definition that um Derek and I think is much more akin to our view of what learning is and we think this is a really helpful way of understanding retrieval. There are lots of different activities that account as retrieval so I've mentioned things like um, low stakes testing, teachers um, have reported using things like multiple choice questions, um, short problem solving things, true false questions, labelling diagrams, there's quite a long list of activities that you could use for this but what we're seeing, and this is something we're seeing in practice, as well as something that the, um, the research literature is telling us. The most common kind of form of retrieval practice at the moment in schools is use of low stakes quizzes. And this is being used all over the place. And we are just wondering, is this the best way to do retrieval? So just to take a look at the research and the literature for a minute or two, what is what do we actually know about this thing we're calling retrieval practice? One really good place to go is um, a review of the literature of cognitive science done by Perry et al for the EEF. And this is one of the many strategies that they examined. And they looked at um, a wide range of literature, actually. It was a, a really um, a thorough, detailed, systematic literature review. And what they found was there was overall really positive evidence for retrieval practice as a useful strategy. But they did have some caveats, such as quite low ecological validity. So actually not very many of the studies were carried out by teachers in realistic classroom settings. I think they've only found four that met their kind of most strict criteria for that. And they also raised questions about what isn't yet known and fully understood, such as we're not really sure about the complexity of learning that might be suitable for retrieval practice. Does it work for these more complex connected ideas as well as it does for kind of recall of simple facts? And that's something that we're gonna be exploring a bit more today. They also raised questions about whether or not the process of retrieving might reinforce misconceptions um, that we haven't really properly thought through yet how it's linked with processes of feedback and classroom assessment. There's a bit of work to do there with integrating it into other ideas that we already have in education. And there are questions actually about the emotional aspects of retrieval and for the learner, whether it's successful or not. And some teachers reported about how it can be really quite discouraging for those children who repeatedly find themselves getting the answer wrong. And we wonder what, um, what idea is being consolidated there. So to dig into some of those questions a little bit, in particular this one about um, does retrieval practice work for learning that's of more high complexity as well as high factual recall? Well, the headline really is that there was encouraging but not conclusive evidence. Um, so it was a bit mixed, really. So this first study by um, Weinstein and colleagues suggests that the format didn't matter whether it was a multiple choice quiz, short answer questions, didn't really seem to make much difference. Whereas other researchers found different things. So for example, Agavali and, and colleagues found that using a mixed quiz, if it had both factual and more higher order questions, if you had both, that actually increased performance in higher order um, kind of tests than either of them would on their own. Uh, Yang et al. also found that actually, if you did retrieval practice, that does benefit conceptual learning and children's ability to apply it in problem solving situations. On the other hand, um, there's work that suggests that if you've got 
too much of this kind of high interactivity, too much complexity, the testing process might actually inhibit rather than facilitate learning. And maybe there's something there to do with cognitive overload and how these all might be weighted. So I think what this is really telling us is that perhaps we need a much more nuanced approach to matching retrieval tasks to the kinds of knowledge that we're thinking about and to the particular learners. So I think this is, as ever, somewhere something um, in which as educators we need to think really carefully about how we're using the, the science. There's another suggestion here um, from Carl Picker and some other colleagues that actually we need to think about the amount of success that's experienced by learners in the process. Um, and, it, and a suggestion that actually all learners should be experiencing some success. It's not, not okay just to be retrieving and getting it wrong all the time. Um, maybe if that's happening less than 50%, some kind of prompt, some kind of scaffold or scaffolding might be useful. And someone with a background in education, this is starting to look to me very much like Vygotsky's zone of proximal development and how we're judging whether or not um, our learners are in that zone. And we can imagine perhaps that that cumulative feeling of doing retrieval practice across every subject, across the curriculum every day, which perhaps hasn't been explored yet in research, we might need to think about where does this leave the learners? Derek, back to you. Thank you. I think having sort of spent a bit of time looking at what is written in the literature and from what we hear elsewhere are going on in practice, Kendra and I sat down and said, well, let's rethink this, not going quite back to first principles, but certainly asking the question, what does it mean to us as teachers, particularly, as well as researchers and in the learning sciences? And if one of the first places to start very briefly is what do we want retrieval practice to do for pupils? Um, and if with the next slide, just try and summarize it literally. In short, we're trying to consolidate the knowledge that our pupils and students build up. But at the same time, it's strengthening the wider processes of learning that are required to do that. So it's much more than just simply recalling facts. It's much more about learning the processes as well and making more knowledge more readily available. So the, it, each bit of knowledge that we have, we need to be able to build on to link to other ideas, whether we're in, in school or whether we're outside doing our normal day, daily job, living, etc. It also helps us to support the ability to chunk the knowledge we've got and to recall stuff immediately so that we reduce the cognitive overload that we all experience as we try to learn something new. It's all very easy to say, I've got it on my iPhone, but that in itself takes action from you in terms of where do you lock on the iPhone, et cetera, et cetera. It's important that we actually have some information available to us directly. And particularly important is building the th our thinking skills and processes. The brain isn't dormant. Is that doing things is an active organ. So it's how do we actually increase our ability to think and our ability to carry out those processes. But as Kendra has always pointed out, and we need to um, underline this, we need to minimize the unnecessary stress and pressure that are on our pupils and avoid the boredom. If you know that you're going into a lesson every time they're going to say, right, we're doing retrieval practice, here are five questions, answer them, you know, it begins a bit boring and you get a little bit blase to be honest about it. So I think it's important that from our students point of view, we have a better understanding of what we're trying to build with them and therefore modify our pedagogy accordingly. And but before we do that, just look at a little bit about what's going on in the brain. Now I'm not going to attempt to dissect the brain and give you lots of big words because I can't remember them without checking them up. However, it's important that we look at the brain as a whole organ rather than just little bits. It's basically a network of wires. It's not fixed. It's active all the time. We're using an awful lot of it all the time. And one of the points to remember is that reuses energy. And in fact, it's probably the largest amount of energy that you use normally. It's going on all the time. But what we're trying to do and what it is trying to do is make new connections between the various cells in the 
in order to create pathways which help us learn things. Not just making the connections, it's about strengthening those connections in order to make sure that they're robust. When we want to recall something, when we want to come up with a solution, we've got something really solid to build on. And a bit that's often forgotten, we wanted to suppress inaccurate or false connections through a process called cognitive inhibition. We all too often think about, we get something wrong and it goes away. Well, actually it tends not to, it tends to sit in the brain. And if we're not careful, we will make a false connection and therefore that will lead us down a route which isn't helpful. So it's about bringing those bits of information together. And we often call those memories. They may be complicated, they may be simple, but they're rarely one-to-one -one pieces of information. So when we're reacting and responding to the stimuli that we see, whether it's through sensory, smell, sight, movement, emotions, speech, we're all being brought together by the brain in order to make a difference in order so that we can understand better what we're trying to solve the problem of or recall or the conversations that we're going to have with people. And the other interesting thing about the brain is to bear in mind that it changes itself, physically changes as we learn by making new connections, etc. It changes by the environment in which we fi it finds itself and things that happen. And this is termed the plasticity of the brain. So that, for example, if somebody's had a stroke, the, the brain starts to find new pathways in order to make them function in ways which are suitable and appropriate for their condition. So in terms of retrieval, clearly making connections is an important part. Cells that fire together, wire together, the Hibbian association. It's an important part of it is making those connections and then reinforcing them so that they become reliable, both in terms of immediate recall and in also thinking of other ideas. And when we then look at the brain as a whole, and we get the next slide with the picture on it, which indicates the activity that's going on in the brain through the various connections. The, level, the colors, apart from making it a pretty picture, actually also indicate the levels of activity that are going on at a particular time in the brain. So that in the, particularly in the cortex, which is the outer surface of the brain, we are making these connections. So the information that we get, the actions that we um, identify all begin to work together rather than separately so that the brain has certain regions which are often called association regions which I think the next slide indicates so yeah Miss Wong, well, that's it. brilliant so we have association areas not going to focus on which where they are or any but but really just to point out that there are then parts of the brain which bring these ideas together, these, which as I say, are called association areas. The different senses combine to help recognize the memory that's going on. Our attention from one thing to another shifts so that we might have had something sparked off by something we've seen becomes reinforced by something that we may have smelled or heard so that we start to make sense of what those two stimuli mean or bits of inf new bits of information. It's where the brain starts to plan and reason in terms of understanding the process of what the next step is in the topic that we're dealing with or the idea that we're developing. But ultimately, things become learned, stored and reconstructed, or we might say remembered, so that we can actually draw on that information without having to add to the workload that the brain is, is carrying out at any one particular point in time. So in terms of conceptual learning, what that translates into largely is that we require an activation of a permanent information in the working memory, pertinent information in the memory. We focus on particular bits of information. Those are the ones that we bring together in our working memory. And the, Bear in mind, the working memory is limited in size 
tend to think of only holding five to seven pieces of information at any one time. So if we're having to use that too much, we tend to forget things, we miss things, and therefore overload occurs. But working from the working memory process, we start to bind that information together so that it becomes a chunk of information which makes sense in itself. And that then needs to be translated into long-term memory where the consolidation is critical to the process of learning. And it doesn't happen immediately. It happens over time through process, which is active process, but it also happens in, speak, in sleep. So that some, to some extent, our consolidation of memory isn't entirely under our active control. It, ha it actually happens more passively when the brain is making sense of what we've seen, what we've heard, and how we put things together. So bearing in mind the, the importance of the reiteration in terms of developing the long-term memory, retrieval practice helps build that strength of the memories that we can recall. And in the next slide, just a very simple model of what the memory is. Focus on something that provides the attention that we need. It is absorbed into working memory where it is brought together with other ideas in order to start the learning process, which then is an iteration between working memory and long-term memory. The re remembering takes place because we put it into, into long-term, we take it out, we put it in, we take it out. So it builds up a process. Anything that we don't use, we tend to forget, whether that's through the working memory or even from the long-term memory. So that the process of memories is an important part of building up that we take, we have with our um, retrieval practice. So in, in essence, building up memory helps reduce overload, partly because of the memory, the, and, sorry, the energy issue that I mentioned earlier. It's about consolidating ideas in order to build that long-term memory, and we can hold that information. The more that we use that information, the more that we remember it and it becomes secure. We make sense of what the brain needs to know and what to forget. So there are bits of information which we can discard, but we actually have to do that as part of that inhibition process. And as I said, and I keep repeating, the importance of the minimization of energy use in order to bring things together. If we remember it and we know it, it helps as that, that next stage. It allows more of the brain to be active in identifying new relationships and solving problems through that process. And one thing again, which I always think is important, is remembering that memory isn't stored as a single item. Essentially, memories are reconstituted, reconstituted every time we, we, we recall them. It's not like a photograph which is why when you try to recall incidents, for example, that you've experienced in the past, sometimes you actually recall them differently. You emphasize different things. You miss things out. And that's because it means that the memory hasn't quite put it together in the same way as it would normally do. So basically, in terms of looking at the brain um, and, and building the what we've tried to do, I've listed in the next slide, because this starts to build, I think, into the next section of the pedagogy. So that by these processes which are going on in multitude, multitudinous ways pretty well all the time, to strengthen the memory, it improves reading, re reasoning skills as well. So that we're recalling our existing knowledge, that's one part of it. We're elaborating that, so we're looking at different details. I always remember a story of a, a tutor talking to four-year-olds when they asked what color a daffodil was, and everybody said yellow, which of course is correct. But then the tutor, who happened to be an art tutor, started to ask, is it exactly the same yellow, or are there different sorts of yellow that we can see? So you're starting to tease out and elaborate that knowledge into more subtle um, interpretations. It extends that range of knowledge from not just one 
situation, but to new situations and apply that understanding of change of color, for example, into new contexts. And it initiates new ideas and relates things together which may not initially appear linked. It's part of that problem solving. And I come back to the suppressing in understanding as well. We need to be able to suppress misconceptions, go away, don't go away. They hold they we often hold them for long periods and they resurface. So we've already always got to have a brain which is going to suppress those misconceptions. And I think that's where I pass over to Kendra, who says, so what? This is what we need to think about in terms of developing our own pedagogy across um, all subjects, not just science or maths or English. Over to you. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, it, there really is the, always that so what question, isn't there, when we're thinking about how we, we learn from um, the learning sciences into education. Um, so I thought I'd start with, um, there's a group called the Learning Scientists, and again, very useful web pages. They have advice for pupils, first of all, based on this notion of retrieval practice. So they say things like, right, when you're trying to learn something well, you need to put all your books away, write down everything you know, sometimes called a brain dump. Practice tests, they might feature again, use flashcards. But can you see here, again, they're going beyond that kind of just factual recall. They're saying, yeah, go beyond the definitions. Think about the links between ideas. Don't just recall the words. Don't just recall the definitions. Make sure you're recalling the main ideas, how things are different from each other, and adding in some new examples. We've also got this um, attention to feedback there as well. Check your accuracy and a nod really to that emotional dimension. And it can be hard. It's, um, it's much easier just to reread the same stuff over again and give yourself the illusion that you're, um, you're learning. But actually this process of retrieval is quite challenging for learners. And then as teachers, what do we need to do? Well, it seems to be one of the key challenges actually for teachers is to identify the ideas on which we should focus retrieval, which one should we give that extra time? And um, when we're thinking about the elaborative forms of retrieval, which ideas is, is it that we think um, we want to link together and draw together? So there's a bit of understanding of the curriculum and the content, subject knowledge there that really matters. We need to think then about how we can give children time to thought, to talk, to talk and time to think about their ideas as talking is always part of that process of making connections. We need to think about how we can help them with that organising and linking of ideas. What activities can we give them that are going to be short retrieval activities but do the job? And again, that idea about then transferring that knowledge from one context to another. And can we, <coughs> excuse me, build in checking and feedback into those? Well, in many ways, it seems like I've just made what was a lovely, simple thing. Just let's give them some low stakes quizzes every now and then. I've made that really complicated. And um, so I think what I should do now is perhaps make it a bit less complicated again with some practical examples. One of the things we've been working on at Bath Spa is doing exactly that, thinking about what activities we can actually design that might be helpful. And we've drawn on the work of Shima Mura, who's a neuroscientist, who said, well, actually some of the things that we need to do with our learners um, to help them make these connections and see distinctions, we need to get them to compare, to contrast, to categorize, to look for those connections but we also need to give them opportunities to talk, retelling and asking questions. And we've drawn on that to produce what we call five C's in a Q um, as the basis for a whole series of, kind of mini activities that you could do as alternatives to low stakes quizzes. I tend to primary science in my example, so there'll be a lot of that here, but um, we think they could be used much more widely really is an example for a comparison. So you could start with simple diagram, common in classrooms. What are the names of the different parts of a plant? Petals, leaf, stem, maybe getting as far as the, um, the, 
parts that are involved with reproduction, like the pistils, the stamens. But that of itself is quite a limited concept. And we first of all would want to make it richer by actually looking at this in terms of real plants. So that might be the first comparison to make, whether or not you pop outside or maybe bring plants inside. How can we compare words and diagrams with real plants enriching um, the different modes that you're using there? To take that a bit further again um, from that diagram, not all flowers are the same. So can we do this as a simple compare and contrast activity? This one could be just presented as a slide on the whiteboard for a few minutes of discussion. And in the process, we'd be inviting children to use their language about the parts of the plant. And the teacher would kind of step in and help and join in, give some feedback, extend the vocabulary as well in that process. Another one, um, we might invite children to categorise, sticking with this same plant theme, seems quite spring-like today. You could have a whole collection of leaves, you can invite children to sort, to categorise them. And in this way, you're kind of elaborating that basic concept of a leaf away perhaps from kind of one simple, almost cartoon-like green shape to look at the whole variety of leaves that are out there and, and to kind of enrich that concept of what it means to have a leaf. Um, you could do a little variety on this um, kind of triadic elicitation in which you pick three, three items, three leaves, which two would you put together for some reason and which would you leave out? And that could be kind of repeated over and over again. So again, you're kind of asking children to remind themselves about parts of the plant, in this case, a leaf, but in a slightly richer way. We could also invite children to make connections between different ideas. This one again could just be presented as a slide, with some different images in a very open-ended way. Perhaps a bit further down in the topic when children have already got quite a lot of ideas, um, for example, about flowering plants embedded, could you invite them to make wider connections? Why might there be some flowers in a field? How might those connect with that bee? What about the power cables? I don't know what connections you're making in your mind at the moment. For me, um, there are things like, do we actually have perhaps a shortage of pollinating insects? Why might that be? Um, is it to do with pollution, perhaps? To do with the way that we're producing power, the way we're using our resources? Wasn't there a problem with um, sunflower oil associated with um, the war in Ukraine. We might also make connections there between power supplies in Ukraine. So we could go way beyond even that um, idea about parts of the plant and thinking about pollination to just bring that into, um, into issues that concern sustainability, biodiversity perhaps, and, and connections with, um, with bigger world pictures. So it's a way of revisiting an idea, but revisiting it in a broader context. As an example of being creative, using those ideas again in a different way, you could take your ideas about seed dispersal and you could do a whole big, um, an entire lesson perhaps based on this prompt, but you could just do a five minute Right, we want to draw on all our ideas about plants. Just turn to somebody near you. What do you think happened next following this picture? Can you tell the story? What happened to that last dandelion seed? And so you're just reinforcing those ideas about seed dispersal by wind, thinking about where it might land. Would it land on fertile ground? How far away from the plant would it be dispersed? And at the same time, there's an opportunity there to be listening in and thinking about what has been understood, and perhaps what hasn't, what's, been, what's present, what have the children really taken on board and taken ownership of, and which things do perhaps need to revisit. The last of the five C's in the Q category was question. Here, you could actually hand over the role of generating questions to the children. You could use a simple prompt like this photo here, a daisy and a dandelion. Could they come up with three questions about parts of the plant? So they might come up with things like, hmm, where are the stamens? 
some plants, it's really not as obvious as the classic buttercups that we often use. How were they pollinated? Why have they got so many petals? You can imagine all sorts of questions being generated that's reusing that language, but in a way that's actually helping the children to take ownership, ownership of it and make use of it. Tried to come away from primary science um, for a bit. This um, pushed me out of my comfort zone. So any English experts out there, you might have something to say about this. I um, wonder if this would work as a quick starter for retrieval in the context of English. Take one stanza. This is a poem by William Blake that seems to feature in a lot of GCSE syllabuses. Could you again just invite children to spend a few minutes generating some questions about it and see if they could use some of the knowledge that they've been working on for so long. This could be science again but it could be geography so some images just to make children think what do we know about what's going on here how can we make connections between land use perhaps environmental damage got a bauxite mine here that's some um, the raw material for making aluminium and maybe the children will know maybe they won't and you can start again connecting together these issues in that wider context of sustainability making that knowledge useful and therefore a bit more relevant as well maybe even in PE and perhaps um, we could move away from the idea of starting with a slide as, um, as our basis for a quick big sort of retrieve and elaborate Perhaps another example of a compare and contrast, actually. Could you, perhaps in netball or basketball or even in football, in, in your pairs, show me three different kinds of passes that we've learned. So the feedback for you is you actually see what the children are doing, which, which have they remembered, how are they, how are they performing them? And then the elaboration could be asking the children to say, right, which, which is your favourite and why and would they say? I don't know, maybe. I like doing a bounce pass because it's quick and really sneaky. Or I like doing the long arm overarm throws because they're really powerful and you can get it right down to the other end. So as well as that sense of just practicing the passes, you're thinking about how you use them and what, um, what, content, what context you might want to use different passes in. And perhaps there's a bit there about emotional connection as well. Which ones do you like best and why? So a little whistle stop tour there between some possibilities just about how you might bring some of these ideas into into real practice that might be a bit a, a bit useful there. Uh, what I must say is that we're in the process now of trying out some of these ideas with teachers with children, hopefully with um, quite a lot of ecological validity by looking at them in a variety of different classrooms. Uh, that's something we're doing over the next year or so. So watch this space. If you want to see any more about what we've been doing so far, and we'll post new materials on here as well. If you look up buzzbard.ac.uk learning sciences, you can, um, we've got various free downloads and things that you can use. Also, if you do try out any of these, whether it's with students or pupils, children whatever age learners of whatever age we'd really welcome a bit of feedback so do get back in touch with us and, um, and tell, it how, tell us how it goes really what the issues are how you might have refined things made them better so just to kind of wrap up what we've been talking about today really we've been thinking about moving our ideas about retrieval to what we see as richer forms of consolidating knowledge and strengthening learning. We're thinking about retrieval as being a bit more than that, just that recall about how retrieval practice is strengthening connections and actually how retrieval practice can build new connections as well. So that brings us to the end of what we wanted to say to you. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, hopefully that's been thought provoking for you. Um, I know Derek's been keeping an eye on the chat box and thinking about what's happening there. So shall I hand back to you, Derek, and um, maybe there's time for a few questions. Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. I'm looking at the chat box and I can't see anything at the moment. Obviously, people have gone to sleep. Um, can, can I suggest you unshare your screen, Kendra, and 
We allow people, if they wish to ask questions, to do it in person, or you can still add it to the chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. I appreciate that. Um, but we are always short of time on these things. Um, I hope it's gave you some ideas. Um, and so it's any questions, any suggestions, anything we've got right, anything we've got wrong, um, or what we ought to go and do next week. Not a, not a question, but the Blake idea is great. Would it work well to engage and would work well to engage pupils with the poem? So well done, Kendra. Thank you to my uh, GCSE studying daughter for her help. With that. <laughs> uh, another comment that loves stressing the need for elaboration and extension and application. And I think I think that's sort of what we started from with the idea that too many of the idea, the um, examples we've seen is simply saying, what's the answer to this? Yes, no, and move on, rather than trying to make links um, across. And I think one of the things that really worries me is the lack of transfer of understanding across subjects. We think the processes only take place in one subject. So if we're talking about evidence, we talk about it in science as though nobody else talks about it across the curriculum. They do it in history, they do it in English, they do it in geography. You know, those sorts of things we need to help children move across as well as straight up and down. Um, love the thinking about the dandelion seed. Can you, re you I don't realize how creating activity can reinforce learning memory? Do they need leave time for this? Um, this connects well with the constructional approach to teaching. I think the problem with the monotony of low, stick, low stakes quizzes can be understated. Um, question about misconceptions. Sorry, it's one of my hobby horses. Um, you mentioned the persistence of misconceptions in memory. Do you have any advice beyond directly addressing misconceptions. Um, well, it depends what you mean, uh, Faye, who I think wrote that question, um, by addressing misconceptions. And you can do it as a confrontational activity, which I don't think is very helpful, but to be aware and be bear in mind that children and ourselves, let's be honest, we've all got them, tend to look at misconceptions and don't stop and think about it. And it's probably a case of questioning, getting children to stop and think again, because they are the ones who are actually acting, um, developing the process of correcting that misconception. So if we simply say it's wrong, the impact on them is actually quite negative, I would suggest. If we actually say, are you sure? Or do you think such and such would happen if, it, if we did this? Or what would happen if we did that? starts to get the children to think more about what they've just said and why it not be, might not be correct. And particularly in, in some of the science stuff where you've got counterintuitive ideas where ch children do make these mistakes, um, but not to downgrade them as being completely wrong and stupid. Well, very often they're the things that become the building blocks for the next step of learning because you've learned something that isn't correct and something else that, will, that is better. But that doesn't mean to say you, you ignore misconceptions. You have to work with them as part of the learning process. Um, Just coming back to um, Anne's point about the dandelion seed, I had an absolute treat today working with um, primary science colleague uh, David Allen, who's been thinking about science and drama connections and actually looking there about how there are lots of drama activities, some longer, but some really quite short that you could develop in all sorts of ways just to give, yeah, that sense of using and applying ideas, whether it's sort of putting them in a quick um, hot seating type activity. Um, yeah, so, so those are the kinds of things we're gonna be trying to build in in our project, thinking how can we make these sort of lively and different, as many different imaginative ways as we can to, to retrieve the knowledge, but perhaps not in a dull way. 
Anything else that anyone was wondering or anyone out there wanting to, to question? We've got a, a follow up on the, the misconceptions um, about whether dealing with misconceptions is more a teaching response or about building other responses that out compete the mistaken ones. It's a bit of both in the sense that as teachers, we've got to recognize that that misconception is what the child thinks and we we need to try and modify that. And therefore by asking or responding in ways which help them to do that is important. But at the same time, as I think I said earlier, um, it's ultimately the child who's got to come to terms with that misconception and modify it accordingly so that the mistaken ones are not recalled, but the, the correct ones as we would see them are. Um, also, another question about high stake assessments. Um, do you think it might be an issue encouraging students to really care about delving deeper into the information they need to know? How would you answer that one, Kendra? Goodness, yes, it is, isn't it? Um, I suppose that's what I'm trying to do with the, the connect examples is just provide a few little hooks to to life beyond the classroom that might help make the relevance more more present, more more related to to the science knowledge. It, it's a real issue. I mean, not not just science, of course. That's what I fall back to. Yes, because exams matter to children they matter to families but I think children as well like to think that what they're doing matters in some bigger sense as well so I, I think if we can allow them to have those bigger thoughts there they'd be up for it I think part of it comes down you know comes down to where how, where our own philosophy if you, if you like um sits but it's important that learning in school is about more than just getting through the exams now i know it's easy for me to say that not not having to do it anymore but i think it's important that we do give children this opportunity to go beyond the exams and i'm sure a lot of teachers do anyway but it's a kind of not letting feeling guilty about it um is part of the issue we, we do tend to feel a bit guilty if we're not asking them things that are exactly on the curriculum curriculum or the um, exams that we, we're expecting. It is about thinking about how we develop them wider than that um, as part of that process. And I think it's one of the things that was highlighted earlier about what we know about um, retrieval practice or don't know about retrieval practice. The impact of using, if you like, short factual answer type tasks as opposed to higher, higher level skilled tasks and mixing them together you tend to get an improvement in both. Maybe we need to look at that a little bit more carefully, because I'm quite a strong believer in the fact that if we just focus on the facts, that's all they'll ever learn. If we focus on a bigger picture, we start to get those facts into um, perspective and therefore where they fit and how they actually build onto our greater knowledge and our ability to go further and learn more than just simply remembering a particular date in time, which, you know, we all remember 1066, but what were the implications of it? It's a little bit too far away. And yet, every time you sort of hear it these days, I find there's more about it by people asking odd questions, which we need to encourage students to do. Um, do you think teachers realize that when children feel loved and are comfortable and confident, they articulate, articulate misconceptions more easily and thus enables teachers to discover and address these. A difficult one, but my guess is that if students feel there is have no fear about being in quotes wrong, then they're prepared to express their ideas. And then by discussing those ideas and sharing those ideas with their peers, and with their teachers, you start to come to a more accurate and um, correct, in inverted commas, response to the question. Would you agree, correct, Kendra? Yes, and I think getting the right balance between a classroom environment that's challenging and you can ask people questions and find ways of 
addressing ideas that aren't the right ideas or aren't the ideas that you want children to have but doing that in an environment in which children feel safe and that that's that's what they're there for really that that can yeah that is hard to do that's part of the art of teaching isn't it how to get that right balance between when it's when it's time to push when you accept when you think right that idea for the moment I might leave that for now I'm going to come back to that later it's it, it is an art I think um no no easy answers there yes, sorry Aidan has just used a word that I love um to over atomize the curriculum and I couldn't agree more we tend to get into the little bits and forget the bigger picture and fitting big bit, little bits together with no overall plan is quite tricky where you've got a plan or a scheme that it works now i don't mean a scheme of work i mean a, a, a schema to work to where the little facts fit it might become much more remember memorable because you've got other ways of remembering the fact rather than a one-to-one -one relationship um Sally is asking, maybe we ought to understand a little bit more about what it means to forget and what that involves than simply recalling so that we can understand better some of the ideas that we're talking about and practice recall in a more effective manner. Um, somebody commenting, which I think justifies why we asked the question at the beginning, about low stakes of quiz at, 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 at atomic facts is already direct demonstration of retrieval. And I think that is the worry. There's, retrieval practice isn't the only thing that has become or sensed to be a silver bullet to act, sort things out. It isn't. Um, and the danger is that as soon as somebody picks up on it, it gets squeezed and the emphasis shifted in a particular direction, which actually undermines what it was setting out to do in the first place. Perhaps that's a good point to think back to the nature of the research that's been done on retrieval practice and that criticism that a lot of it hasn't been done in real classrooms. And you wonder about, say, what the motivation was of the people doing the tests in different lab conditions why were they motivated to to work to recall to retrieve and how can that um how might that be very different from the kind of motivations that you might see in a complex classroom different subjects children bringing different feelings and attitudes to every session so i think this is where as teachers we really need to think about how we're going to be applying some of these findings from cognitive science so can I say thank you to everybody for um, being so involved and, and listening so patiently. So thank you very much for coming. And we hope to see you at the next Learners webinar um, in two or three months time. Thank you very much indeed.